Hello, uh, welcome to Notre Dame ND Energy Center's fourth annual research symposium. This is Subhash Shinde. Uh, I'm the associate director for ND Energy. Um, we had our first day yesterday. If you are just joining us, we are excited to welcome you to the fourth annual ND Energy Research Symposium. This year's theme focus on achieving carbon neutrality with an emphasis on global, global partnership and climate justice. I'll be introducing the three speakers in the first part of this afternoon. As mentioned yesterday, the goal of this research symposium is to highlight world renowned research experts and industry leaders who will share their insights, perspectives, and expertise on several important topics surrounding the urgency to tackle climate change, reduce carbon emissions, and create a clean and sustainable energy future for all. Presenters will address several key questions and offer strategies for achieving these goals. The presenters explore their unique experiences and approaches for achieving carbon neutrality. In addition to that, they will also address the role of partnerships and engaging the entire community so that all voices are heard and contribute to the development of viable and equitable and just solutions. Uh, we are requesting you to save your question until the end. At that time, you can use either the raise hand function or post your questions in the chat box, whatever you prefer. Thanks for joining us and we'll get started now with the first talk by Megan Litker. She's the director of sustainability programs at American University in Washington, DC. Under her leadership, American University became the first university, first research university, and first urban higher education institution to achieve carbon neutrality in 2018. She will talk about American University's path to carbon neutrality, share some challenges faced along the way, and the importance of partnerships and the value of active student involvement. Please join me in welcoming Megan Litker. Megan. Hi, thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Okay. Um, so um, thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm excited to, to share our journey in the hopes that it'll help other people um, get there as well. So when we achieved carbon neutrality in 2018, we joined a few smaller colleges that had achieved it, but we were the largest institution that had, had achieved that, that you know, monumental goal at that time. And so today I'm gonna to share a little bit of our, our strategy that went into the years leading up to that. Um, the methods of, that we went about using to reduce our emissions, how we integrated the use of renewables into our strategy, the role of offsets in our program, um, I'll give you a look at our, our footprint over time, and I'm also going to share a little bit of information about the sustainability plans that helped us get there and also our new sustainability plan now that we've already achieved that goal. So this was really the high level strategy that got us to neutrality. We said, you know, way back <laughs> around 2011 that we were going to first work on reduction. And so looking at efficiency, looking at behavior change, looking at how we can use green buildings and green infrastructure across our campus to help just reduce all of our use as much as we possibly could. That would help us right size the next solutions that we needed to turn to. Um, green power, where we've used RECs, we've used on-campus solar and we have off-campus solar as well. Um, and I'll dive into each of those a little bit in a little bit more detail in the coming slides. And then finally, we did have to turn to offsets for sources of emissions that we couldn't um, reduce further at this time, or in the case of study abroad travel that we're not even trying to reduce. So as I mentioned, our main priority has always been reducing emissions. And this continues to be the case even after achieving carbon neutrality so that we can ultimately reduce our reliance on offsets. 
So we started with um, building green. We have a lead standard of gold on our campus. So all of our new construction has to uh, be at least lead gold. Um, we also have used lead for existing buildings to help us manage all of our existing space. And this program has actually been really beneficial. Initially, our goal was to certify 25 of our existing buildings using lead for lead O&M. In the end, we only certified one building, but the process that we went through for that one building led to us changing policies that are used cross campus related to building management, relating to how we track our energy consumption, water use, how we uh, green clean, how we manage our outdoor spaces. So the ripple effects of just certifying one building have really had a huge impact on our campus and reducing our emissions overall. It's, um, I found it to be a, a very useful program just to help guide what our new policies and practices are going to be across campus. And it's actually something that we're revisiting in the coming year or so um, to make sure that our policies and our procedures on campus align with the newest uh, additions of LEAD. We also focused a lot on engaging our campus community in behavior change programs. So um, you can see a picture from a Green Eagle pledge that we did a few years ago, where we asked people to pledge to not use disposable utensils. If they made the pledge, they got a package of, um, of reusable utensils that they could wash. And, and that's gone along with a bunch of other programs that we've had. We've done energy uh, reduction competitions in the residence halls. We've done a lot of tabling and information sharing in the entrances to buildings to help people better understand how to use their temperature settings and how their building is designed to save, to save energy. Um, we focused a lot on sustainable transportation, making sure that we provide as many options for people as we possibly can to help them leave their car at home. Um, we live, you know, in the District of Columbia, we have a metro system, but our campus is actually located about a mile away from the nearest metro stop. So we have a shuttle bus that connects our campus to the metro station. Um, we have shared bikes that are used throughout the city. So we have um, the district's bike share stations located on our campus for our students and our faculty and staff to use. Um, overall, through a lot of different programs that we've had across campus, we've reduced our energy use per square foot by about 30% um, across the entire campus uh, over the course of our sustainability journey, so in the last decade. Um, one of the big projects that actually didn't take effect until after we announced carbon neutrality was the conversion of our centralized steam plant into a decentralized low temp hot water system. Um, and so that system has decreased our reliance on natural gas quite a bit. And it's actually one of the examples of a project that's going to help us decrease our reliance on emissions since we don't need to use as much natural gas. The next thing we focused on was what we could do on our campus for renewables. So we have about 2,500 solar panels on our campus. It's a combination of PV and solar thermal located on 11 roofs. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> this um, fairly large installation of solar panels only provides about a half of a percent of our electricity consumption each year. So it's certainly not enough to meet our, our full demand, even if we covered all of our roofs with solar, um, it, just, it just can't meet our full demand. So recognizing that we weren't the only ones facing this challenge, we actually partnered with the university, uh, with George Washington University, it's located in downtown DC, and they actually have a, a whole different challenge related to solar panels. DC has a height limit on our buildings and many of um, George Washington's buildings are already at that height limit. So they can't put solar panels on because they'll exceed the height limit. So together, um, we installed about a quarter of a million solar panels in North Carolina, which is located within our grid. So we're able to source um, our electricity from those solar panels in North Carolina. So both schools, along with George Washington University's hospital, get half of our electricity now from, from these panels. At the time, of this installation. It was the largest installation of a renewable by a non-utility company in the country. Um, so obviously it was unchartered territory. And the fact that we had a partner involved at another school really helped keep it going. Anytime one school got cold feet, we were able to talk to the other school and kind of work through our challenges together, knowing that we were in it together really 
helped reduce the risk involved. And it gave like our CFO a chance to talk to their CFO about concerns and really work things out at, at individual levels across the university, which made it which made it a little bit more achievable and it helped us kind of keep the ball rolling forward. We were able to um, encourage each other as we went along. So both of these uses of solar panels um, complement the use of renewable energy credits that we've also used. So before we installed solar, we were using 100% renewable energy credits. That was our, our first step into this. We've been able to cut that back because we retain the renewable energy um, rights for the solar in North Carolina. Um, no recs are sold from that project. And so we now only have to buy 50% of our recs. And it's a, a long-term contract for the electricity in those panels as well. And so it has decreased our risk around price volatility in the, the energy market as well. And then the final piece um, of our journey towards uh, neutrality is the use of offsets. And so sort of recognizing that offsets are definitely not a perfect solution. Um, they, we don't consider them our, you know, our final goal. We still wanna focus on expanding our use of renewables and how can we continue to drive down our emissions and look for new, um, new technologies that are gonna help us reduce our use of offsets. We wanted to find offsets that would help us do more than just kind of check the box and say, we got an offset. How can they help? our community, how can they help communities that we're engaged with? How can they provide classroom experiences or other student experiences? How can they provide data that our faculty could use? And so that's really the approach that we took to looking at offsets. The first offsets that I purchased were for our study abroad air, tra air travel. And I picked that because it's such a unique source of emissions. We're not trying to decrease our study abroad program. And so we wanted to find something that really complemented the goals of our study abroad experience for our students. So we ended up finding a project that's located in Kenya. It's an efficient cook stove project. So it decreases deforestation in the region. It also um, employs women um, in the community to sell these cook stoves. It improves indoor air quality. So we felt like this project had so many added benefits to a community. And it's a community that we're already engaged in. AU has three study abroad locations that we manage rather than working with a partner. And one of those is located in Nairobi. So we felt like this was a really good opportunity to you know, expand the relationship that we had with the, the community in Kenya. The next project that we looked into was planting trees in DC. And so this is um, a peer verified offset project. So it doesn't go through the traditional offset standards that we, we make sure we use our third party verified standards for all of our other offsets. Instead for this one, we've partnered with a, a local organization, the Anacostia Watershed Society to plant trees here in DC. So in this case, it's helping to expand the urban tree canopy and, and the district has a huge goal around expanding our tree canopy. So this was an exciting opportunity for us to participate in that goal and help them to further it along. Most of our trees have been planted at metro stations. So they really are expanding the, the urban tree canopy and they're in areas of the city that had a greater need for trees. So um, ultimately another school is going to verify all of our trees that have been planted and approve them for use as offsets. In the meantime, we do use other offsets. So they are, they're paired with other offsets since our trees are not big enough yet to, to qualify as true offsets. So we do buy other offsets from the grid to pair with these trees that are going to become offsets. Uh, next, we looked at sustainable trucking and this offsets university travel. It's obviously not a great um, comparison for the use of airplanes and trains and cars to say we're going to invest in trucking. It's not a, a direct comparison, but I think it helps us to talk about how transportation is just such a challenge. There, there really are some, some limitations there. This was the only offset project I could find related to transportation at that time. And so it's what we want and <laughs> we'll continue to look for more, but it helps us, us tell our story a little bit more. And the same is true for our landfill methane project. So we also invest in um, a landfill that is capturing and using methane and that offsets our natural gas use and our landfill waste and a few other smaller categories of offsets that don't really like warrant having their, their own offset purchased for them. 
And this has really helped us tell the story of, you know, you throw organic matter into a trash can and it ends up in a landfill, it produces methane. And here's kind of how we can close that, that loop. Um, and so a lot of these projects have helped us expand how we get to talk about sustainability on our campus. And that alone has been really valuable in addition to helping us move towards neutrality. We do review all of our offset contracts every two to three years, depending on the project. And that gives us an opportunity to just make sure that we're picking the highest quality project that's available at that time, picking the best thing that's available to match what we're trying to offset. And since these projects are constantly changing, staying in touch with them every two to three years has really proved to be helpful. Our very first landfill project was actually just flaring. We couldn't find a good um, capture and use project. And now we've been able to move to a landfill that um, captures and uses the, the methane, which is ideally what we wanted and just couldn't find in our first RFP. So here are a few of our challenges. So I mentioned the challenges that came along with um, installing the solar panels in North Carolina and how working with another university just helped us overcome a lot of cold feet issues in that project. But anytime we're using new technologies or doing something a little bit bigger, there's risk involved in that and overcoming that is, is a challenge. We've had some projects fail. We had a green roof that is fairly large that we installed on one building and it failed. It was a new technology for green roofs. It had these trays. Um, because of weather in the district, they would fill with water and just become soggy messes and plants didn't want to grow in them. And so, you know, sometimes people would see like that one particular kind of green roof didn't work and then they wouldn't want to use green roofs again. So it does take a little bit of time to be like, well, that's just one kind of green roof. Here are other green roofs that we've already installed on campus that are working. Let's replicate those as we replace this one that, that failed. Um, maintaining steam over time is also a challenge. Um, you know, university priorities shift. You need so many people involved in these projects across the university that, um, that are all pulled in different directions and they all have their own competing priorities in their office. So it does take a lot of effort to keep this front of mind moving forward, making sure that people feel empowered and engaged and want, wanting to keep contributing and wanting to keep coming up with something new. Sharing information is also a challenge. You know, when our solar farm in North Carolina first came online, it was easy to share. Um, a lot of people around the university wanted to talk about it. Now that it's several years old, a lot of people don't know about it. You know, students are constantly cycling through, it gets falls out of the back of people's minds. And so having a huge project like that, that's not visible on our campus is a challenge to keep people aware of what's happening. We are fortunate that we do have a, a bunch of projects that are easily visible. So actually this large planter that you can see in the photo on this slide is a green roof. So it's above a parking deck that's connected to a building. And so even though it's ground level, it's a green roof. And so it gives us an opportunity to talk to people about green roof technology without having to bring them up to a roof and like deal with all the public safety issues with that. So having some of these things that are visible that we're able to put signs on and share is really helpful, but everything we have that's invisible, which you know all of our campuses have, it just is a challenge to talk about. Giving credit is also a challenge, um, making sure that offices that often do things behind the scene, behind the scenes um, kind of have their chance to shine and show all of their hard work is something that we work really hard on, making sure that we spotlight people who have, have in, invested their time and their energy into some project that has had a meaningful impact is something we, we work on. And the final challenge I mentioned is just that neutrality isn't the end. And so, you know, we've spent all of the last decade working towards this goal of neutrality, and then we've gotten there. And then how do you make sure that as you're messaging about that, you make it clear that that's just a milestone. It wasn't the end goal, it never was. And so there's more work to be done. We still need people to maintain that level of engagement. And that's a, a challenge as we, as we keep going. Here are our emissions over time. So I'll just uh, quickly share the first bar, the, the like greenish bar is our projections. So if we had you know stayed with business as usual back in 2005, this is where our emissions would be. The next bar, the light tan bar, is where we're at with our emissions um, if you don't include any of our renewable energy and if you don't include any of our offsets, so our, our gross emissions. Um, 
And then the final bar is our net emissions once you include renewable energy, renewable energy credits, and our offsets. I left off 2020 just because the data starts to get a little weird as we all vacated our campus for COVID. Um, and this is just the outline of our 2014 plan that helped us get to neutrality. It focused a lot on engagement, a lot on how we're going to maintain our grounds and our infrastructure, achieving carbon neutrality by 2020, looking at our purchasing and our waste management, employee engagement, um, community engagement as well, community service, and looking at investing. In our new plan, now that we've achieved carbon neutrality and we also actually announced divestment about a year ago, um, we have some, a lot, of, a lot of the same themes carry forward. We're still focused really heavily on engagement. We're still focused really heavily on infrastructure. We've now added a few other pieces. We wanna be more intentional about our inclusion of environmental justice and wellness in our programming, making sure we, we bring those to the forefront. We also wanted to call out each individual area of our operations to give them an opportunity to really showcase what they're doing and have a little bit more ownership in this process. And then um, finally, we've added an administration section focused on maintaining carbon neutrality and how we'll keep everybody engaged as we go forward, sort of sharing, sharing our, our work. Um, this plan has been a few years in the making. It's a five-year plan. Our last plan didn't have a timeline associated with it, but it sort of organically turned into a five-year plan. And from what I've noticed just in the availability of technologies, the changing landscape of research in the world of sustainability, the changes in community engagement as the world just becomes more aware of sustainability and climate change problems, um, five years just sort of made sense for us to, to work on that again and then give us a chance in the not so distant future to revisit and recommit to a lot of things. I've listed a bunch of offices that have really become some of our key partners. This is certainly not an exhaustive list. We really rely on each office across campus recognizing the role that they play in our journey towards sustainability and how they have a unique role that they can play. We have a green office program that intentionally has some blank spaces when you're filling out your checklist to say, you know, yes, I will make sure our office, you know, turns off the lights at the end of the day. But we have these blanks in there so that each office can think about the unique contributions they can make to campus given their unique role on campus. And um, like I said before, highlighting these opportunities for other offices to show their unique strengths just helps bring more people uh, into the conversation, gives them more ownership, gives them more empowerment to make decisions and make changes in their offices if they know that it's gonna be recognized more broadly. Um, so obviously facilities has played a huge role in so much that we've done. Community relations has also been big, bringing our, our community partners into conversations. New construction plays a massive role um, in, in making sure that we're building buildings that aren't gonna create more problems down the road. Um, our inclusive excellence program is our diversity and inclusion program and they've become key partners in a lot of things. We've recently just partnered with them to create event guidelines that include both sustainability and inclusive um, best practices for, for anybody on campus who's throwing an event to use. And then we re also rely really heavily on our engagement with student groups. So we have a number of environmentally focused student groups on campus, community gardens, groups focused on activism, groups focused on uh, educating around sustainability. And so we've partnered with them on information sharing, on events. Um, we provide some funding for them if they're doing a big project that's going to help broader sustainability efforts on campus. And those students have really, over time, just helped keep us moving forward. They always have innovative ideas. They um, definitely pressure the university to make sure that we keep going in the direction that we should be going in. And so um, their partnerships have been key to making sure people um, are aware of what's happening. So that is it for my, my formal presentation. Um, I welcome any questions though. I, I'm not sure if some came in in the chat. Yeah, thank you very much, Megan. Yeah, very exciting journey here. Um, do have some questions. Uh, first question is by Chad, and I was wondering if uh, Chad would be able to ask this question uh, in person. Chad, are you 
able to? Sure, I can do that. Yeah, um, thank you, thank you. I, I um, Megan, we've looked at this. Um, I'm, I'm currently a graduate student at Virginia Tech, and and, and we kind of did a, a deep dive into offsets, and we just found that they're they're really hard to demonstrate how effective they are. And for example, in, in the chat, I just said they're, they, they can be controversial because it's difficult to know what would have happened if the offset would not have been purchased. Um, uh, and, and there's also leakage where that maybe you've protected something somewhere, but the demand still exists somewhere else. So it's just being pushed somewhere else. And so how do you really vet at this point how effective an offset is for your university? Um, so like I said, we, we first recognize that they are not a perfect solution. We, we know <laughs> that they're not. And so that is why we've maintained our focus on reducing our emissions and focusing on, on those as our, our priority. So for offsets though, we do rely on the third party certifications. We do not restrict to any one particular certification at this time. And that's largely because of the value that we've found in having a variety of offset types just in, in having conversations and sharing information about offsets. So um, when we have an RFP, we don't restrict it to any particular type of offset verification standard. We do require a verification standard though. And the other thing that we require is uh, data from the project so that we can um, share it in our classes. So in the case of our, our landfill, how much methane are you capturing? Can we get some photographs from your site? Um, is it possible to talk to somebody on site? So we haven't been able to do this with the landfill project, but with the project in Kenya, we've been able to have somebody who's on the ground working on that project um, visit, you know, virtually visit a class happening in DC, talk about the project. She also talked about her career path. And so it actually ended up being a really valuable conversation for our students to learn the complexities of a project like this and how, where their challenges are, what they're trying to do, how the community is engaged, how it contributes to all of these other, you know, really global efforts. Um, and so we do acknowledge that we still need to decrease our, our emissions on our campus. And this is just sort of a, a first step towards that. And it, it helps us it really has helped us expand those conversations when we start to share with students, hey, you know, here are the offsets we're buying. We welcome conversations around how offsets aren't perfect because we agree. <laughs> um, and, and that's also why we revisit them every couple of years because we wanna make sure that if a better option has become available, then we wanna take advantage of that. Does that help answer your question? They are definitely a challenge, and I know a lot of universities have just decided to forgo them and, you know, not aim for carbon neutrality. And I think that's one area where it's just about what makes the most sense for your campus, for your, you know, culture on your campus, and for your, your internal sustainability goals. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I, I think that third-party certification helps. I, I think there, there's still lots of questions, and we need to keep um, a very careful eye on those. And just a, a quick follow-up, have, have you looked at carbon insetting and, you know, doing that and doing that within your own supply chain and um, things of that nature? That was another topic that we researched. Um, no, we actually have, have not investigated that. Um, but in our new sustainability plan, we do have a lot of supply chain things to start looking at. And so um, that, might be, that might be one that pops up in, as, we, as we embark on the next couple of years. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, there is one more question. Um, you actually talked about establishing a PV whole farm in North Carolina. Yes. Um, that's actually a very interesting uh, approach. And you know, would it be possible to sort of get to a little into the details? For example if it was completely driven by, uh, let's say, private public entities, but yeah, not associated with the utilities. So uh, um, 
Yeah. We worked with um, Customer First Renewables, um, which is a, a company that helps with these kinds of projects. Um, we did work with uh, Duke Renewables, which is okay. a subset of, of Duke Energy, um, but focused on renewables. Um, we were very careful in siting. So the farmers who leased their land to the project were all voluntary. There was no clear cutting of any forests or anything like that to install these solar panels. These were all previously um, farms and the farmers decided that they wanted to lease their land for solar panels at this time. Um, so actually, uh, I'm not sure which ones I shared photos of, but um, some of them look a little funny, like the outline is a little funny because a neighbor farmer decided he didn't want to be involved and so their farm is, is not. Um, so all of those things played a huge role. I actually was not at the university during the very early conversations around it. I was here during construction and when it came online. Um, so my knowledge of the very early conversations is just from chatting with everybody else who's engaged as, right. as we've moved through it. But, um, but there, there was a lot of figuring out what was going to be the best fit for the two universities involved. We actually also tried to work with the District of Columbia um, they ended up doing a different project. Uh, they just had some different goals and priorities at the time and timelines. And so um, now though, I know of several universities that have partnered with um, entities that aren't universities to do projects like this. Um, and so it, it's helpful to at least begin the conversation with a variety of different players to see who, who might be a good fit for a for a project of this scale to make it as big as it needs to be to be financially viable. So um, for us, we really needed a partner to make it big enough for us. And so the, the partnership with another university helped us make it, um, uh, helped us scale it up enough to make it a, a reasonable project for us and keep it in our, our budget. Yeah, it's very, very interesting example. Uh, a related question uh, is, do you, have you considered having something like storage uh, with it uh, that you can actually locally house? It doesn't have to be in North Carolina, but you can house it so where you are. And... Not at this time. Um, okay. I think those conversations have kind of come up and okay. been pushed down the road. So um, not at this time is the answer, yeah. Yeah, and then the, the one more question. You had a decentralized, uh, did you say, you decentralized your heating uh, yeah. system related uh, inst I mean, equipment? Yes, unfortunately we don't have any good data yet because it came online literally two weeks before COVID. Ah. So, <laughs> so we haven't yeah. had a full campus yet to give us some good data about like, the actual yeah. impacts of it. But yeah. yes, we have had a centralized steam plant on campus for decades. It was reaching the end of its life um, and so it needed to be converted to something else. And so we ended up converting to a decentralized low temp hot water system. Um, and it has some cogeneration in, involved as well. Oh, okay. And um, it was a massive undertaking. You know, the entire campus had to be dug up for the laying of the new pipes and um, all of the new infrastructure going in. And it, we're excited that that part has finally ended. Um, and I'm excited that campus will be populated again in the fall so that we can get some good data and see, see, what, the, see what the real impact of this project has been. Um, as we look to the future, because you know, I think a lot of us are facing this challenge of if we invest in this new natural gas technology, we're committing to natural gas for you know, how many more decades. And what we've begun to discuss is you know, how can we convert the, the new system into a system that uses geothermal as we move forward. So um, I think that's kind of opening the door to not feeling like we've kind of locked ourselves into um, using fossil fuels uh, until this system wears out. We have, um, we have an, another avenue that we can consider when that becomes a little bit more feasible for us. Yeah, yeah, that, that's very interesting. And you know, it's something similar to the path uh, Notre Dame has been on and uh, we welcome you to visit whenever you you want, and you know, see what we are doing here as well. Yeah, thank thank you for a thank very you. interesting talk. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much so, for the invitation. I yeah, I, 
yeah, Ginger and Bob have done an excellent job of putting this all together. So uh, they are they are to be recognized for this also. Yeah. Thank you. So we'll move on to our uh, next talk. Uh,